give God praise tonight. Amen. Amen. Thank you to the song service team and all those that helped out behind the scenes. Uh, tonight, like I said, um, we're going to have a few of the men come and preach. Uh, we've all written the sermon together, but we're going to be doing one point each. So we're going to get straight in, into it tonight. So why don't we welcome up our brother Dylan as he comes up to the stage. Good evening, church. How are you all tonight? Amen. Would you do me a favor and turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter number 26, uh, verses 36 to 41. Amen. I'd like to take this time to thank Pastor uh, for giving the privilege uh, to preach with uh, the brothers uh, Mason and Damien. Um, we're not here to fill a spot tonight. Can you say amen? Amen. In India, on the 27th of May, 2019, a bus carrying 52 passengers crashed, killing 29 people. Now, the bus was traveling in the early hours of the morning, and it fell off the motorway. I think we have some pictures on the screen. Falling 40 feet into, the, uh, into a large drain below. The crash site was so bad that the reporters said that when the rescuers were res uh, recovering the bodies, it was like they were fishing because of the amount of bodies that were there. And all of this happened not because the roads were slippery, not because the roads were bad, not because someone was trying to hijack the bus, not because the weather was bad. All of this happened because one man, the driver, fell asleep. The text we're going to read is one of the most famous stories in the Bible. It's when the disciples fall asleep. Matthew 26, 36 to 41. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. The disciples got comfortable. They slept, and by doing so, they compromised. Our prayer tonight is that we don't get comfortable. Our prayer is that we get uncomfortable, so compromising is no option, so that the only option in our lives is to be Christ-like. So tonight, the brothers and I want to preach a sermon we've called Sleeping Disciples. Amen. Let us pray. Father, I'd like to thank you, Lord, for the privilege, Lord God, to preach your word. I'm praying, Lord, you'd anoint my words and Damien and Mason's, Lord, I'm praying, Lord, that you speak to your people tonight. We give you back all the praise and all the glory, and glory in Jesus' name. We all said, amen. Tonight, I want to firstly look at comfort. In our text, we see that Jesus found the disciples sleeping. Verse 40, then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, what, could you not watch with me one hour? The disciples were sleeping while Jesus was praying. Instead of doing what Christ said, instead of following Jesus, they slept. And the night before the crucifixion, when Jesus was counting on his three main disciples, Peter, James, and John, they folded and fell asleep. Sleeping disciples. When Jesus prays, sleeping disciples sleep. Now, how does this text apply to us? Well, in this text, you and I are Jesus. In this text, you and I are the disciples. The disciples sleeping in our text is a perfect picture of comfort. See, comfort is a state of physical ease and freedom from pain or constraint. Now, in the story I told, the driver got comfortable. He had the lives of 50 souls in his hand, but all that mattered to him was his own comfort. But how often can that be you and I? Instead of putting the souls of others before our own comfort, 
we put our own comfort before souls. The driver chose comfort, and when he did, he went blind, literally, causing his bus to end up crashing down nearly three stories into the drain below. But just like how the driver was blind asleep, if we, if we allow comfort to reign on the throne of our hearts, we will, be, we will be blind spiritually. Verse 45, then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the son of man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. See, a sleeping disciple is no, be no better than a blind sinner. Real quickly, here, two, here are two ways that we can get comfortable. The first way we can get comfortable is by evading responsibility. Evading responsibility is when you purposely make decisions in life so that you don't have to answer for anything to anybody. Because of our sinful nature, we want the most comfortable option, just like the disciples in our text. And when you have to answer to nobody, then you only have to answer to yourself. You become the Lord of your life. One of the best examples of this is Jonah in the Bible. Jonah 1, 1 to 3. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Listen to this. But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found the ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down to it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah was called by God, but instead of taking responsibility, he chose the comfortable way out. And we know the story. God doesn't let Jonah go away without chasing him down. Because choosing comfort over responsibility is foolish. And the story of Jonah reminds me of one of Pastor Mitchell's quotes. God will not make you do something you don't want to do. He will just make you wish you had. That's, that's one way we can get comfortable. The second way is by joining the Not My Ministry ministry. <laughs> you may have heard it already, but Not My Ministry is when there's something obvious that needs to be done. And because you're not in that ministry that's responsible for it, you don't meet that need. You leave the need unmet. We have to be careful that we don't become people who have comfort as their king. And we leave needs still as needs. Needs are meant to be met. Can you say amen? amen? If we can't meet needs inside the church, how can then we expect to meet the needs outside of the church? And sometimes I understand we have a lot on. Many of you, you've got kids, you've got a wife, a husband, a job, a mortgage, rent, insurance, bills, and fuel, and food, and food, and food, <laughs> and food. And the list goes on, but... Not my ministry is a wrong mindset to have because we should, out of necessity, be of the mindset that, you know what, it may not be my ministry, but it is my church. That is my brother. That is my sister. If we don't feel obligated to help, we have some serious problems. Look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Paul is saying you can't be a part of the same body and not be impacted by the needs of your brothers and sisters. I want to ask you a question. Are you impacted tonight by the needs of your brothers and sisters? As we ponder that tonight, church, let's give God praise as Mason comes. Praise God. Amen. Thank you to our brother Dylan for that point. Powerful. Now we've seen what a comfortable Christian looks like. Now let's look deeper into what that can cause in our lives. Amen. Heading on to our second point, which is compromise. Now let's refer back to our main text. And I want to highlight uh, this verse, verse 41. It reads, Jesus replies to the disciples saying, what? Could you not pray with me one hour? Watch and pray. Lest you enter into temptation, the spirit is indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. Now sleepiness came over the disciples at the garden. Their physical need overcame their desire to obey Jesus. 
And this is what is meant further in the scripture where it says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. When we grow um, comfortable with where we are, it becomes easier to settle for the lesser things in our walk. Amen? Doing the bare minimum and compromising God's word. Now, when we get comfortable church, it becomes easier to settle for less. Now, in the text, the disciples would rather sleep. They would rather sleep than watch and pray. I mean, who would want to do that, right? I know, I know a few people. Oh, actually, it sounds good. But how many know? Yeah, some people would rather sleep than pray. But Jesus is saying, stay awake, watch, and pray. And this was the hour that Jesus was born for. His whole life, his whole ministry led up to this point. And here the disciples sleeping. As seen in um, Luke chapter 21 verse uh, 36, it reads, Keep alert at all times and pray that you might be strong enough to escape these coming horrors and stand before the Son of Man. Jesus says, watch and pray. Why? So that we may not give in to temptation. And two, so that we may have the strength to get through these coming horrors. Jesus instructed them to watch and and pray so that, they might, so that they might be steadfast in their faith because he knew that they would need it in the coming hours of his crucifixion. Watch and pray, church. Watch and pray. Jesus says, watch and pray with me. Emphasis on the word with because he knew that after his crucifixion that the disciples would go on and be subject to persecution just as Jesus was. So church, if Jesus was praying at this time, how much more do you think that we should be watching and praying each and every day. What happens after? We know that Peter goes on to deny Jesus three times. And this, we learn that compromise leads to three points. Number one, rebellion. Peter rebelled against Jesus. And we know early in the text, he's very adamant that he will not deny Jesus. That we know that when the rooster calls, he denies him. Number two, a lack of focus. Now the disciples were asleep. They weren't focused. They weren't alert. And like the disciples, comfort can cause us to also take our eyes off of Jesus. When we're not focused on Jesus, we become idle, without purpose, without effect. And like the Bible says, idle hands are the devil's workshop. Number three, disobedience. Now Jesus went away and came and returned to them three times, saying, could you not watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you are not given to temptation. I can imagine Jesus here standing there. He's given his whole life to this very moment and the disciples can't even give him one hour. One hour to watch. Amen, church. Now we can easily translate that into our own walk. Could you not give one hour at outreach? One hour in prayer every morning. One hour in reading. Jesus has given, has given his whole life. Yet we can't even give him one hour. But we need to understand, church, that good things never come from comfort zones. What good came from the disciples sleeping? A good night's rest, and that's it. But Jesus is here about to be crucified, and the disciples are more concerned with their own comfort. Jesus left, now, hello, um, um, church, Jesus left the comfort of his disciples, and we see in the text, to go a little further and pray. Now, church, strength is found outside of your comfort zones. We should never be satisfied with where we are. Now I want you to think, have you ever seen an Olympic runner run um, halfway during a race and say, I right, have done enough, I'm done. You know, that doesn't make sense. So if that doesn't make sense in the world, how much more wouldn't it make sense in the kingdom of God? They go on to finish the race as seen in, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and I've remained faithful. You have finished the race. I mean, see here, church, that the word faithful is associated with only those who have finished the race. The faithful finish. Amen? Not those who are sleeping. Now I want to close with the scripture real quickly. Uh, going back to what Dylan said, 1 Corinthians 12, 26. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now, church, our destinies are intertwined with one another. The people you see sitting next to you here. And like all those people on the bus, it only takes one person to fall asleep. Now, we may not see the consequences of being comfortable just yet. But, church, don't wait till 5, 10, 15 years down the track where you 
find yourself trying to clear the rubble, trying to clear the rubble of sin, the rubble of comfort that's burying your family, that's burying your brothers and sisters, that's burying your destiny. And like this crash that we shared earlier, burying the souls of men and women, children out there who God, who you may not have known, but God has called you to them. So church, let's never be satisfied with where we are because God has called us not to comfort, but to conquer, to eternal glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Praise God. Thank you to our brothers who opened us up. Amen. Now that we've looked tonight at our being comfortable and also compromising, we're going to close off tonight at, uh, at looking at Christ, like what it means and what it means to become a good servant of Jesus Christ. Amen. And verse 42, it reads, Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My Father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. And like I said, now that we've heard about what it looks like uh, when we're comfortable or when we're uh, compromising um, and how this can affect us, let's speak um, about some ways of how we can overcome and uh, become Christ-like. Amen. Let's look firstly at overcoming comfort. Overcoming comfort means saying yes to God's will. Overcoming comfort means saying yes to God's will even when you don't feel like it. Have you ever seen someone, or maybe you are this person um, that, you know, during dinner time you're folding, you're about to fall asleep while waiting for the food. Um, have you ever met someone like that? Uh, I haven't. <laughs> um, but it's like, you know, this is the best time about your day. You know, you're about to have some food, you're about to have some dinner, but you want to go to sleep. Like, come on, man, wake up. We're about to eat some good food right now. Um, but we we're going to refer this back to the disciples. See, they could have received good food. They could have received spiritually good food, but instead they chose to sleep, like our brothers mentioned earlier. And the one thing that we can learn from them, from the disciples, is to not get comfortable. You've heard the word comfortable probably a hundred times this evening, but it's very important that we apply this, that we don't become comfortable in the things we do. In this situation, they showed comfort, as you know, by sleeping while Jesus went away to go pray. And this shows the devil's signs of weakness. You may ask why. And that's because when we become comfortable, temptation starts to creep in. When we become comfortable, we start to slack off from God's will. Jesus uses Peter's drowsiness to warn him about temptation. That he would soon face him. But the way that we can fight temptation this evening is to always be alert, is to always pray, and stay spiritually equipped because temptation strikes when we are most vulnerable. The times where you're weakest, the devil likes to come and attack you. Before you even know it, man, the devil is in. He's in your head. He's in your marriage. He's in your life. And you need to be alert at all times. We need to make it an everyday thing to allow ourselves to spend time with God. This is how we stay equipped every day. We need to be, we need to be desperate for the word of God. Um, speaking of being desperate for the word of God. There's a story um, of myself. There was um, about maybe a month or two ago, my phone broke. My phone broke overnight, so I woke up the next morning. I was um, going to read all my messages that I thought I had. I was going to um, read all my notifications. And I woke up, and my phone was just dead. It was dead, so I tried charging it. I tried putting on the charge. I tried fixing it, um, putting it in rice like the Asians do. Um, but I wasn't coming back to life. And so at this point, I was eager. I was like, man, what's wrong with my phone? I was eager to try to fix my phone. I went to every shop I could um, just to find the cheapest quote so that I could fix my phone. And eventually, by the end of the day, I fixed my phone. But the reason why I share this is because I was desperate for my phone to come alive. I was desperate just to see messages that weren't important. This is how we should be in the Word of God. We should be desperate to wake up every morning, read the Word of God, because God's word is more important, amen? God's message is more important to us. And it should be that way every time. Amen. Um, and this also goes um, in our school places, our workplaces. We must shine Jesus Christ's light everywhere we go. Because people are always watching, but so was God. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 27. But I discipline my body 
and bring into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself become disqualified. Paul speaks about exampleship here. When he, when he talks about being disqualified, he doesn't talk about him backsliding, he doesn't talk about losing his salvation, but more so the privilege of telling others about Christ. The, the, and the privilege about leading them to Christ. And this is important about how you show yourself when you're around your family and friends that aren't saved. And tonight I want to tell you that you know, it can become one thing to tell others about Christ or tell them what to do. But if you don't apply it yourself, then that's a waste of advice. Um, so tonight, church, I just want to tell you that it's really important to practice what you preach. Amen. The second thing tonight, so the first one was overcoming uh, comfort. The second one is don't compromise. So uh, Mason spoke about this and his point, but we're going to talk about how we shouldn't compromise. And we should have an eternal mindset. Don't just live for today. Don't just live about what's going to happen today, but always have heaven on your mind. And one way to do this is to love what you do. If you come to church and it's a burden to come to church, it's a burden to come into your car and drive to church, then you're missing the whole point. You're missing the whole point of why we have church. You're missing the whole point of God's vision, of God's plan and God's purpose for your life. Rather, instead of having this mindset, we must love, com love coming to church. You know, love the worship, love the preaching. Even if it's not good, we still love it. Amen. I love your ministries. Come and love people. And most importantly, love God. Because God has sacrificed so much for you and I this evening. And it's important to never forget what he's done for us. Another thing before I quickly uh, close is to share your faith. Many of you here, you've been changed and transformed. Your testimonies are the most powerful thing that you could ever share. And I encourage you to share it. Tell, tell people about the mighty things God has done in your life. Plant the seeds. Some people may respond straight away. Some people may not. But when you plant the seeds, it works. It works into people's lives. When they go through a certain situation, when there's a problem that they go through, they know who to turn to. They remember the story you shared with them, and they would want the same thing. So it's real important to share and what God has done in your lives. Our young ones, set an example. If your family and friends aren't saved, set an example now. Now is the best time to show them that you are truly living for Christ. And regardless of what others may say, write the scripture down. First Timothy, First Timothy 4 verse 12. It reads, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you say and the way you live and your love, your faith, and your purity. So church, tonight as we close, let's not be sleeping disciples, amen. Let's be wide awake. Let's be ready to preach the gospel. Let's live Christ-like. Let's show everything that God has done in our lives. Remember, God was, uh, Jesus, he was, he was okay with being uncomfortable. He was obedient, and he did not once compromise about what he was going to do. Although he knew what was coming ahead, he fought his battle. And tonight, that's what I want you to do. I want to leave you with this message is fight your battles. Even when you feel like quitting, even when you feel like giving up, don't. Because the blessing always comes when you're obedient. Amen. Let's not be sleeping disciples this evening. Amen. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes as we close off this evening. Praise God.